allowing the steroid molecule to attach to the androgen receptor and start that sweet anabolic process, resulting in more muscle mass. Vigorous Steve here. What is the best time to inject gear? One of life's biggest questions. When is the best time to administer these anabolic androgenic steroids, which is going to increase our muscle mass and improve our overall sense of well-being? Well, long story short, let me give you guys a spoiler alert. The best time to inject is before activity, ideally in a fasted state. Now, with that out of the way, let me explain. Stick around, you might learn something new. But before we do, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Before I explain how it came to that conclusion, I must first explain what happens after you inject steroids. And for the sake of this video, we're going to limit it to the esterified steroids, the testosterone inotate or the nandrolone decanoate, the trimbolone acetate, for example, because those have different pharmacodynamics compared to suspensions, being testosterone suspension, or winstrol suspension. Now, after administration, the carrier oil and its active pharmaceutical ingredients disperse throughout the muscle. A injection depot is not a perfect sphere. It will disperse throughout the muscle, taking all kinds of shapes and thus increasing its surface area. And as this carrier oil disperses, lipases, which are enzymes which break down fat, will start to act on the surface of this injection depot slowly metabolizing the fat into free-form fatty acids, monoglycerides, diglycerides, or triglycerides. So that means that the carrier oil that you're administering has slight caloric value. Monoglycerides, diglycerides, and triglycerides contain calories. Now, assuming that a one milliliter administration contains about 50%, 75% carrier oil, which can be broken down by lipases, each administration of one milliliter will yield approximately four to seven calories. Keep that in mind. So if you're administering three milliliters per week, for example, that's not so much additional calories that you're administering, maybe 12 to 21 calories through an exogenous administration. It should be a non-issue, but still something of note, which I wanted to mention in this video. And as the injection depot turns into several fat droplets or multiple injection depots, this further increases its surface area, allowing more lipases to metabolize the fat away. As these small fat droplets metabolize, the, surface, the overall surface area gets less, prolonging the duration of which these esterified steroids end up in the extracellular space so in the beginning, you see a very rapid peak in serum concentrations, after which they decline. And it mostly has to do with lipase enzyme activity and the overall surface area of the injection depot. First, it goes up and then it comes down. So ultimately, it's the overall surface area of the injection depot, which determines the rate at which esterified steroids gets liberated from the injection depot and ends up in the extracellular space within the skeletal muscle. Now, this is also called the interstitial space. And once the esterified steroid molecules are there, they can proceed to enter central circulation for them to be metabolized in other tissues. And keep in mind that esterified steroids are not the active pharmaceutical ingredient. They're merely a prodrug, and they're only active after the ester has been metabolized from its steroid molecule. And that brings us to benzobenzoate and benzoalcohol. Benzobenzoate is a solvent excipient, commonly used in the esterified steroid formulations to increase its solvency and allow the pharmaceutical ingredients to be suspended in a carrier oil. Now, benzobenzoate disperses from the injection depot quite rapidly, certainly a lot faster than most carrier oils with the exclusion of um, MCT oil. And it's the same as benzoalcohol, which is a bacteriostatic preservative and local anesthetic, also disperses from the injection depot quite rapidly, certainly a lot faster than the carrier oil, which needs to be metabolized by lipases. So now we have benzobenzoate and benzoalcohol, both metabolizing and dispersing from the injection depot rapidly and thus acting as a prodrug delivery method of the esterified steroid, which is contained within the injection depot. So not only does the lipase enzyme activity contribute to the rate at which esterified steroids enter central circulation, benzobenzoate and benzoalcohol also contribute because they disperse the esterified steroids 
throughout skeletal muscle quite rapidly. And keep in mind that benzobenzoate and benzoalcohol metabolize quite rapidly also. Now, it is of note that both of these compounds can potentiate some toxicity in several tissues of the body. So they should be metabolized and excreted from the body as soon as possible. Benzobenzoate metabolizes or hydrolyzes into benzoic acid and benzoyl alcohol. And ultimately, benzoyl alcohol also metabolizes into benzoic acid itself. Benzoic acid is rapidly excreted through the urine. It has a serum half-life of only 16 minutes. So knowing this, it's very important to stay hydrated because hydration helps with the excretion of benzoyl benzoate and its metabolites, which could have a potential negative effect. So ask yourself this, at which point during the day am I most hydrated? It's probably during your workout or during fasted cardio, which most people drink at least a liter or one half liters of water as well. So again, make a mental note of that. It will lead into the conclusion, which we'll discuss a little bit later in this video. Now, benzoyl alcohol depletes from the injection depot within approximately 52 hours. That means a little bit over two full days. Benzoyl alcohol helps with the delivery of the prodrug, being the esterified steroids, into the interstitial or extracellular space, allowing it to be absorbed into central circulation only within the first 52 hours after administration. So that means that regardless of ester, you need to administer your steroids at least every two days. Now again, benzoyl alcohol depletes from the injection depot within 52 hours. With this information, we can um, estimate that the half-life of benzoyl alcohol from an injection depot is approximately 10.4 hours let's say between 10 to 10 and a half hours. But unfortunately, I can't find this information for benzyl benzoate. I can't find its half-life, nor can I find the rate at which benzyl benzoate completely metabolizes from the injection depot. That information is currently unknown. So we can only base the rate of the injection frequency based on the rate at which benzyl alcohol metabolizes from the injection depot being every two days or so, every 52 hours. Now, like I mentioned before, once the esterified steroid molecules have been liberated from the injection depot, they can finally enter the central circulation. But the central circulation is actually composed of two separate systems. We have the cardiovascular circulatory system and the lymphatic system, which is actually a one-way system. The right quadrant of the lymphatic system, which includes the right part of your torso, your right arm, and the right part of your face, it all drains into the internal jugular vein located here approximately. And the other parts of the lymphatic system, including the lower right side of your body, drains into the subclavian vein on the left side of the body located here. Now, both of these veins lead into the heart. So the fluid that moves through the lymphatic system eventually ends up in the cardiovascular circulatory system through these two veins. Now, the cardiovascular system is circulatory because the heart pumps blood first through several different organs. It goes to the lungs to be oxygenated. It goes to the intestinal tract to be enriched with nutrients and passes through the liver and the kidneys to be detoxified. Now, once the heart pumps blood to various tissues of the body through the veins ending up in the capillaries, it is in these capillaries that the blood plasma can diffuse into the interstitial space containing the oxygen and the nutrients and of course, fluid, which helps to dissolve and disperse these esterified steroid molecules, which is now present in the skeletal muscles where this administration took place. Now, in the average human, approximately 20 liters of fluid exits the capillaries into the interstitial space, but only 17 liters of this fluid returns into the cardiovascular circulatory system through these capillary blood vessels. And it's its remaining three liters of fluid that coincidentally ends up in the lymphatic system and then returns to the cardiovascular system through the two veins located in your neck. Now, for this to happen, the lymphatic system relies on movement. It doesn't have a pump like the cardiovascular system has in the form of a heart, which pumps blood around. The lymphatic system is reliant on skeletal muscle contractions, which kind of forces the fluid through the lymphatic system, eventually ending up in the two veins in your neck. So you'll need to do movements for this 15% of fluid that doesn't return into the cardiovascular system to 
end up in the cardiovascular system, but first passing through the lymphatic system. Again, if there's no movement in the body, you're completely sedentary. I'm sure many of you guys have experienced when you're on holiday and eating a little bit too much foods, there's a lot of delivery of nutrients in the through the cardiovascular system to the peripheral tissue. And when there's no movement, this fluid remains. You start to get edema in places you did not expect, maybe even your hands, your face, obviously your ankles because the gravity kind of pulls it down. This is because the lymphatic system requires activation through movement. And if you're not performing any movement, this interstitial fluid remains in place. So knowing this information of how the central circulation works, we can assume that 15% of the esterified steroid molecules are going to end up in the lymphatic system, ultimately getting drained through the subclavian vein or the internal jugular vein right into the heart. And the other 85% is going to enter the cardiovascular system directly through the capillary blood vessels, which are located within skeletal muscle. So what we want after an administration, especially within the first 52 hours, we want a very high turnover of the interstitial fluid to end up in the cardiovascular system as well as in the lymphatic system. And for that, we need movement. We need movement to activate the lymphatic system and we need to increase our heart rate to pump more blood throughout the cardiovascular circulatory system paired with proper hydration that allows for more fluid to enter the extracellular interstitial space, allowing the esterified steroid, which just was liberated from the injection depot, to diffuse through this fluid. 85% of this fluid containing the esterified steroid will end up back into the cardiovascular system, which has now higher turnover because the heart rate is increased. And through activity, the lymphatic system gets activated by movement, allowing the remaining 15% of this esterified steroid to end up in the cardiovascular system, ultimately for it to be transported to tissue where the ester can be metabolized from its parent hormone, allowing it to become pharmaceutically active and interact with the androgen receptor or other receptors which it might have moderate affinity for. Now, the key here is, after all of this absorption and metabolism and circulation, is that the esterified steroid need to be metabolized by esterases, specifically carboxyl esterases, which is a family of esterases which metabolizes esters from steroid molecules or esters from other medications. I mean, carboxyl esterases are involved in the metabolism of many different kinds of pharmaceutical drugs, including antiplatelet drugs, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, central nervous system stimulators, and several narcotic analgesics. Now, luckily for us, carboxyl esterases are found in most tissues of the body. They're found in very high concentrations within the liver and the intestinal tract, but they're also present in skeletal muscle, the kidneys, and even white and brown fat. There was a study performed on mice where they looked at the tissue distribution of the messenger RNA for carboxyl esterases family 1 to 5 within several different tissues. Again, this is a mice study, but I'll put it on the screen nonetheless and link it down below. So you have a little bit of an overview which tissues contain particular carboxyl esterases. But unfortunately, I can't find any mapping or correlation between specific genes and certain esterified steroid molecules. All I can determine from these studies is that the liver contains many different kinds of carboxyl esterases from the different families and a very large amount. And skeletal muscle contains a select few carboxyl esterases families or subsections of a particular family at a very low amount. So from this data, we can determine that esterified steroid molecules are predominantly metabolized and turned into its active pharmaceutical ingredient, being the actual steroid molecule within the liver. Within the liver, guys. So now we know that we need to perform some activity. We need to know that we stay hydrated. And we need to make sure that our liver health or our liver activity is optimal for these esterified steroids to be metabolized. Now, I'm unsure if consuming a meal has a negative effect on carboxyl esterase enzyme activity, but I do know that liver metabolism almost shifts to a polar opposite, going from a fasted state to a fed state. 
So after fasting for about eight hours or 10 hours overnight, liver metabolism is significantly different compared to after eating a meal in the form of breakfast, for example, where the liver is actively trying to store or restore liver glycogen stores and try to detoxify and metabolize all of this food, which is now coming into the stomach and the intestinal tract. So liver metabolism changes significantly, going from a fasted state to a fed state. And you can see this on the insert of many different medicines. Take this medicine upon waking in a fasted state. Now, how much that we can extrapolate to the use of um, estrified steroids? A little bit wishy-washy, right? A little bit uh, the dubious extrapolation. But still, I would say that liver metabolism is probably more favorable for carboxyl esterases metabolism of esterified steroids in the morning, right? When you're properly hydrated. So the only thing that's passing through your liver is fluid, allowing the esterified steroids to circulate through the liver, metabolize, return to the central circulation so they can potentiate their anabolic effects on tissues. Something of note, it is a little bit dubious, but again, I'm just extrapolating from the medication inserts that I've read throughout the year. But from this data, we can assume that there is a slight localized effect at the site of administration. Again, because the esterified steroid diffuses into the interstitular space, might end up into cells of skeletal muscle, where carboxyl esterases will metabolize the ester away, allowing the steroid molecule to attach to the androgen receptor and start that sweet anabolic process, resulting in more muscle mass. Still, I think most people would mistake localized inflammation from the administration for actual accrual of muscle tissue. But if you were to compare the localized effect of a steroid administration within skeletal muscle to a steroid administration within a subcutaneous space regarding its possibility for fat loss in the white fat tissue, I would say that those results would be pretty comparable. Again, they would metabolize due to the carboxyl esterases present in both tissues. But I would say that the results are marginal at best. Marginal. I mean, if you want localized site enhancement, I would look towards the peptides. And if you want to look towards localized fat loss, I would look into glucagon injections or helios injections, which contain clenbuterol and yohimbine. I would not consider spot injections of esterified steroids into adipose tissue in an attempt to facilitate fat loss, even though some fat loss is clearly androgen mediated. I think there's much better solutions to accomplish that goal. Again, there's very limited data on carboxyl esterase activity in various tissues. So right, I just thought I'd mention it here because it is of note, something interesting, something to consider um, if you're thinking about localized site enhancement through steroid administrations. It is of note that red blood cells themselves also contain carboxyl esterases. So as the esterified steroids enters the cardiovascular system into the blood, the red blood cells within the blood will absorb some of the esterified steroids and metabolize them into its active pharmaceutical ingredients, allowing it to become active and attached to the androgen receptor. Now, red blood cells themselves don't have androgen receptors, but white blood cells do. And I was not able to find a study if there's a correlation between steroid intake the amount of red blood cells within the bloodstream, right, your overall red blood cell count and your hematocrit levels to see if that reduces white blood cell count concentrations further. Because it is known that the free androgen index or the amount of free androgens within the bloodstream, not bound to albumin, not bound to sexual binding globulin, and don't contain an esterified attachment, rendering it physiologically inactive, free androgens in the bloodstream are known to lower white blood cell count concentrations. Now, that could also be because some of the esterified steroids travel through the lymphatic system, which is part of the immune system. So there's a little bit of an overlap there. But again, these are studies which still have to be performed. But it is of note that esterified steroids do metabolize in the bloodstream, albeit to a very low extent, right? Not to the extent that esterified steroids are metabolized within the liver or the intestinal tract and probably not even to the extent that they're metabolized in skeletal muscle, you will have an individual preference to particular steroid ester molecules. So what I've noticed myself, my individual carboxyl esterases from all the different families that are out there and the different genes in different organs and tissues, 
My body prefers enanthate. Some people prefer cypionate. Some people prefer propionate. Some people prefer acetate. So through a little bit of experimentation, you'll have to figure out which ester your body prefers best based on your individual carboxyl esterases production within different tissues of your body, allowing you to determine which ester you can probably get away with for the most stable serum concentrations, the least amount of post-injection pain because there's not so much metabolism at the site of administration, but the metabolism happens in other tissues. So again, there's many different kinds of carboxyl esterases classified into five different families. And since we don't have any mapping between these families and particular steroid esters, you're going to have to undergo some self-experimentation to figure out which esters work best for you. I would love to say that I did all of these experiments so you don't have to, but in this case, it highly depends on your individual makeup. So you'll still have to go through the experimentation process. So maybe as a quick way to figure it out, you can try testosterone enanthate and masterone enanthate for a while and then switch to the exact same dose of testosterone propionate and masterone propionate. I'll do the calculations on the screen so you don't have to. At least I can help you in that sense so you get the exact same amount of steroid molecules, right? The, the testosterone dose is exactly the same and the masterone dose is exactly the same, maybe with the same administration frequency of doing daily administrations, you might notice a difference between the enanthate formula and the propionate formula. Now, unfortunately, trimbolone enanthate you could try, but there's no trimbolone propionate, for example. So again, you'll have to match the esters accordingly to figure out which individual carboxyl esterases seem to favor particular steroid esters in your individual scenario. So after all of this discussion, an explanation of human biology of what happens after a steroid administration, we can summarize a little bit and say the following. It's probably best to stay sufficiently hydrated following a steroid administration. It's probably best to perform moderate physical activity to increase systemic circulation, whether that's the cardiovascular circulatory system or activating the lymphatic system through movement. You might be able to take a thousand milligrams of taurine to help balance the osmotic pressure between the intercellular and extracellular space. Again, allowing this uh, interstitial fluid to pass through the capillaries and the extracellular space into the lymphatic system unobstructed. It's probably best to stay away from food for optimal blood flow and unimpaired metabolism within the liver, allowing these esterified steroids, once they finally end up in the liver, to be metabolized by the carboxyl esterase enzymes. All of this that we know now, in which situation do all three points match? Fasted cardio. And if you're doing daily administrations of 25 milligrams testosterone enanthate or 50, or a whole slew of compounds containing a carrier oil and benzoyl benzoate and benzoyl alcohol, you do your daily fasted cardio as well. Probably a 40 minute video to tell you to do your daily fasted cardio. <laughs> but this is what it takes for you fuckers to get on the elliptical. I have to bait you in with steroid topics to end up doing daily fasted cardio, man. The things I have to do to prevent your heart attack. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website. <laughs> Figure Steve Zucker. Oh man, I'm sorry, guys. Um, yeah, let's continue. Personalized advice, always available through consultations. You can find the rates in the consultation section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Have a look at my new workout clips channel called Vigorous to the Max, where all my awesome sets are documented. When I train in the morning, you bet your left testicle I administered some anabolic steroids about an hour prior. Yeah, let those esterified steroids circulate, metabolize in my liver to return to the skeletal muscle and potentiate some front double bicep action. Vigor screw, you guys know what to do. Much appreciated, much love. Sorry for all the laughs and jokes at the end. But yeah, sometimes I gotta bait and switch you guys so you can get your education in by yours truly. Steve out.